Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of the renewal rounds. And from Kidney Education and Research Network, I, I'm trying to see if we have uh, Dr. Vijay Kher on the line. He is indeed on the line, but looks like he's not connected to uh, the audio. So we'll start. And the topic that we are going to discuss today is the 2017 Clinical Practice Guideline on the Prevention, Diagnosis, Evaluation, and Treatment of Hepatitis C in Chronic Kidney Disease. This is a new guideline document which has been developed by the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, or KDGO, uh, which you all know. This is currently in the draft form uh, in the sense that it is available right now for public review and the address at which it is available for public review is given here. Uh, the way this process works is that once the line, guideline group develops the draft document, it is put out for public review and, and the comments that come in out of public review are incorporated in the uh, in, in the In, in the document, so that can be uh, then finalized. Uh, in all likelihood, uh, the doc document which which is right now here will undergo only minor modifications uh, while uh, the final uh, document is, is prepared. So let's go over that and see what are the changes which have taken place since the last uh, guideline document, uh, which was published in 2008 and, and I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this. Uh, so uh, let's see how, how, how it goes. So uh, what I will do over the first section is to, is to try to tell you a little bit about the guideline development process and how uh, the guideline statement should be read so that you are able to uh, make the most use of any guideline document. So th these were the uh, board group members of the Hepatitis C uh, guideline which, which currently is under development. Uh, so you can see that the work group co-chairs were Michel Jatoul from, from Belgium and Paul Martin from, uh, from University of Miami in US and you had uh, work group members from all over the world which included uh, Western Europe, Egypt, Italy, uh, uh, India, uh, Latin America, in uh, Argentina and, and, and China and so on. So let's, let's uh, just review a little bit uh, how uh, the guideline statements are written and you would see after, at the end of each guideline statement a number uh, which, is, uh, which is the grade of, uh, of or, or the strength of recommendation and, and so they are divided into two grades, uh, level one and level two. Level when at, at level one uh, recommendation, the, the wording which is used is called we recommend which means that most people in your situation would want the recommended course of action and only a small proportion would not want it. Whereas level two uh, recommendation which is a, a weaker level of recommendation is uh, indicated by use of the terminology we suggest which, suggest which means that a majority of people in your situation would want the recommended course of action but many would not. So there uh, the, the physician or or the nephrologist or the surgeon, transplant physician has the ability to make some choices, has the leeway to make some choices, whereas level one recommendation would mean that most of the, there should be a very strong reason to not to uh, implement that particular recommendation. And that number is followed by a letter, uh, which is uh, A, B, C, or D, which indicates the quality, quality of evidence, which is uh, which has been uh, reviewed to make that uh, level 1 or level 2 recommendation. So the quality of evidence can be high, moderate, low or very low and when the quality of evidence is rated as high, it means that we are confident that the true effect is very close to the actual estimate of the effect. Whereas uh, in, in D, the estimate of effect is supposed to be very uncertain and is uh, likely to be often far from the truth. I think it's also uh, important to tell you how the guideline process, uh, development process takes place. So when we 
start the process of uh, developing guidelines, we need to see uh, or create a hierarchy of outcomes. The hierarchy of outcomes means that what are the outcomes uh, which are which are the ones of very high importance or for example starting from critical importance to moderate importance. So uh, any intervention that that impacts outcomes which are supposed to be of critical importance will, will really receive the most attention and of course uh, the highest level of importance is given to hard endpoints such as uh, mortality in, in all situations in the in a transplant recipient graft classes of critical importance as well as uh, uh, ESRD uh, when, when the graft is lost and, and someone develops end-stage renal disease that becomes a matter of critical importance. Whereas in the context of hepatitis uh, C treatment, uh, uh, SVR or sustained biological response or treatment discontinuation due to adverse events are, are of high importance. And of course any serious ad uh, adverse event, development of chronic kidney disease, HCV zero conversion and so on. And the parameters which are of moderate importance are listed in the last column. So uh, having made this hierarchy of, of, of uh, uh, outcomes, uh, we look at all the studies. And the studies, when they are assessed, they are, uh, they are uh, classified into three quality levels. The studies could be of good quality, and uh, a good quality study is uh, supposed to have low risk of bias and no obvious reporting errors. Uh, it is supposed to uh, report data completely, and it must be prospective. In study of intervention, it must be a randomized controlled trial. And uh, a fair quality study might have some risk of bias, uh, but uh, any problem with study or paper are unlikely to cause major bias. If it is a study of intervention, it must be a prospective study, whereas poor quality studies are supposed to have uh, be the ones which, are, which suffer from a high risk of bias or they cannot rule out uh, possible significant biases. And there is some pro problem with methodology, uh, data may be incomplete or uh, errors uh, may be found in reporting. Uh, and such a study, poor study could be uh, prospective and most or all, all retrospective studies are normally uh, listed as, as, as a, re a retrospective study. So now let's look at uh, uh, the grade system. So uh, when, what, when you get a, a clinical uh, study, even in the initial uh, instance, you may assign a high, low, or very low quality evidence, and then uh, you go on and, and look into the study in greater detail, and at that time, you can either reduce or raise the grade of the quality of the study. So the randomized clinical trials always start with a high uh, uh, starting grade for quality of evidence, uh, but you can reduce it because if the study quality shows serious limitations or very serious limitations. And uh, you can raise the grade if the strong level of association is strong or very strong and then uh, if there are no major threats to validity of the study. And thereby uh, we reach the final grade for overall quality of evidence, which is again shown here. And grade A means that the quality of evidence is high and that we are confident that the true effect lies close to the estimate of that particular effect. So with that background, let's go into, uh, uh, into, into the specific uh, recommendations of, uh, of, of, uh, for hepatitis C virus. So we start with screening for hepatitis C virus in, in chronic kidney disease. So the guideline group recommends uh, with a high, uh, high uh, level of uh, recommendation, which is grade one, uh, screening of all patients for hepatitis C intervention at the time of initial evaluation of chronic kidney disease. So it is, it, it is graded as 1C. Uh, and the second recommendation is that we recommend using immunoassay first, followed by nucleic acid testing assay. So if immunoassay shows a positive hepatitis C antibody, then you go on and, and do a nucleic acid testing to follow, uh, find out what is the genotype. Now, however, it is important to emphasize here that the guideline group is going to recommend that in areas where uh, there is a high, uh, uh, high prevalence, then the, it, is, uh, it, is, uh, it is appropriate to use a nucleic acid testing as the initial, uh, initial testing parameter, okay? Uh, because uh, uh, the antibody might miss uh, really the, uh, the infection if it is in the window period. 
Now, we do know that new tests uh, which utilize uh, anti HCV, uh, not anti HCV, but hepatitis C virus antigen are uh, being uh, developed. So, those tests are less costly, but they're also less sensitive because they have a higher limit of detection, uh, which range up to 150 to 3000 units per milliliter. And studies are needed to evaluate antigen testing in, in high prevalence areas. Uh, until, until that type of uh, evidence is available, nucleic acid testing remains uh, more appropriate in the, in the high prevalence areas. The other thing uh, which needs to be pointed out that in patients who are on hemodialysis, samples should be drawn before dialysis. Why this is important is because virus can adhere to dialyzer membrane. Uh, and uh, the guideline goes on to recommend that all patients who are being evaluated for kidney transplantation should undergo screening for hepatitis C virus infection. Now, uh, for specific for dialysis patients, as I said, uh, the sample should be drawn before dialysis is initiated uh, in, during a session. Then uh, the guideline goes on to recommend screening of all patients upon initiation of in-center hemodialysis or upon transferring to another dialysis facility or a new modality, for example, uh, from peritoneal dialysis to hemodialysis, all patients should be screened at that particular time. And uh, again, uh, there is emphasis on uh, using nucleic acid test or an immunoassay followed by nucleic acid test. Uh, the third uh, guideline in this, uh, in this section says, uh, we suggest, so this is a lower level uh, evidence or lower uh, level of recommendation, uh, screening for all patients upon initiation of peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis for HCV infection. The reason uh, this evidence is low, uh, this level of recommendation is low because there is uh, poor quality evidence and because this is uh, dialysis is to be done at home, the risk of transmission is much less. Now, what happens uh, once you have a dialysis patient who have been on dialysis for some time? Uh, the recommendation says that we should screen in center hemodialysis patients every six months. And if a new uh, anti HCV infection is identified, all patients who are within the facility who are nucleic acid test negative uh, should be tested for HCV infection. And the frequency of subsequent HCV testing should, for these patients should be increased. So from six months, you can increase the frequency to once every three months or something like that. Uh, then the next recommendation is that all hemodialysis patients who had HCV infection in the past but have now been resolved because of treatment with uh, antiviral agents should undergo repeat testing uh, once every six months using nucleic acid test. Now, the next level, two recommendations are not really uh, uh, graded uh, and, and uh, the lower level of evidence uh, recommends that or suggests that patients should have serum uh, ALT levels or STPT levels checked upon initiation of in central hemodialysis or upon transfer to another facility or modality. Uh, the recommendation also says uh, that uh, a lower uh, strength of recommendation, which is we suggest that all nucleic acid test negative hemodialysis patients should have SGPT test uh, checked monthly. Now, the value of testing of uh, SGPT or ALT has not yet been uh, really assigned, but the real value of monthly ALT testing is that sometimes when uh, at every six monthly testing, if we pick up an HCV infection, we can go back and retrospectively try to find uh, when the infection was acquired by seeing if there is any rise in the ALT levels, right? So uh, let's go to the next point, which is uh, testing for liver in patients who have been found to have uh, hepatitis C virus infection. So uh, the guideline goes on to make a strong recommendation that all HCV infection patients with chronic kidney disease should be assessed for liver fibrosis by doing a fibro scan, uh, which is uh, the initial non-invasive uh, test. Now, when the cause of liver disease is uncertain uh, or a non-invasive uh, testing results are discordant, then at that time, liver biopsy may be considered. Now, the evidence was really not, uh, not good for this, so this, this recommendation has not been graded. So this is really a, a not evidence-based recommendation, but more in terms of opinion by the guideline development group. So it is possible that sometimes in HCV-infected patients, there could be other reasons for development of, uh, of liver disease, such as uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or alcoholic liver disease, 
in that case it might be reasonable to consider doing a liver biopsy. Uh, the next recommendation which is again a strong recommendation is uh, uh, that patients should be assessed for portal hypertension when they, uh, uh, when they are suspected to have advanced fibrosis which means on fibro scan F3 to F4. Okay, so this is uh, this is important, uh, and it, it has been shown that uh, portal hypertension is unlikely uh, when elastography uh, reveals values less than 20 kilopascals and platelets are greater than uh, 150,000 uh, in parameters. So why this is important is that if these are the values when the elastography is less than 20 kilopascals and platelet count is more than 150,000. Since the possibility of portal hypertension is very low, you can avoid doing an upper J endoscopy to look for, uh, look for uh, uh, esophageal viruses. The other important point is that uh, in, in this recommendation, uh, it has been suggested that kidney transplant is feasible even uh, when, uh, when cirrhosis is, is still present. So cirrhosis, the presence of cirrhosis is by itself is not a contraindication uh, for kidney transplantation, right? Uh, now, uh, the next point is to make is to uh, to tell you about what is the uh, reported prevalence of hemodial uh, of HCV infection in hemodialysis patients, and you can see this is a recent review done for the guideline development group, which shows uh, the prevalence reported from different parts of the world. Uh, in, in different studies, you can see that the prevalence figures are as low as 3% in, in Australia and New Zealand and as high as 19% uh, in the Gulf countries. And, and in, in, in here, you can see the data from India, uh, which are mostly derived from one, uh, one, uh, one cohort, which is uh, run by the Nephroplus cohort, and which shows that it, the, uh, the frequency in different years varied from 8% to about 16%. 16% uh, was in the initial years, but it has now come down. Now, the next set of recommendations uh, really uh, deal with the prevention of hepatitis C virus transmission in, in hemodialysis. And of course, the first uh, recommendation is really quite obvious, which says that all hemodialysis facilities should adhere to standard infection control procedures, including hygienic precautions that effectively prevent transfer of blood and blood contaminated fluids between patients to prevent uh, transmission of blood-borne pathogens. And at the same time, uh, an equal, uh, equally strong evidence is a regular observational audit of infection control procedures in hemodialysis unit and the, uh, and the guideline document will, uh, will provide guidance on how these observational audits can be done. And uh, another strong uh, recommendation, uh, uh, recommendation is strong, but the level of uh, or the quality of evidence which supports that recommendation is relatively weak, uh, but it says not to use dedicated dialysis machines for uh, HCV infected patients, uh, because uh, it has been shown very clearly, uh, and it has been now proved beyond all doubts that hepatitis C virus cannot, uh, cannot pass from the dialysate, uh, from the blood circuit to the dialysate circuit, and since it cannot pass uh, uh, between these two circuits, it is unlikely to infect a uh, subsequent patient who is dialyzed on the same machine. Uh, now, uh, isolation is an important point, and the uh, the the guideline document retains the same level of uh, same recommendation or the same uh, language. Uh, which, which suggests not isolating HCV infected patients in hemodialysis uh, units. And the rationale is provided in the, in the guideline doc document, which is multiple. Uh, first of all, uh, the most important rationale is that there is no evidence from anywhere in the world that hepatitis C virus has been, uh, uh, the transmission has continued when all the infection control practices have been observed in hemodialysis units. So that's a that's a strong uh, rationale for, uh, for making that recommendation. Uh, so therefore, even if you isolate HCV infected hemodialysis patients, uh, you will still need to continue adherence to uh, infection control practices. And the second is that all studies which have shown that isolation reduces the risk of transmission of hepatitis C virus infection have been really very, very low quality studies. And therefore, uh, making a recommendation on the basis of that was not thought to be advisable. 
the second uh, uh, second uh, uh, statement is uh, we suggest which is a low uh, uh, low level recommendation that the dialyzers of hcv infected patients can be reused if there is adherence to standard infection control practices which means that the reuse uh, process should be followed in a separate area uh, then the third uh, recommendation is uh, that all hemodialysis centers should examine and track all HCV test results to identify new cases of HCV infection in their patients. And the final recommendation in this group is uh, to, to take aggressive measures to improve hand hygiene and proper glove use, injection safety and environmental cleaning and disinfection. Whenever a new case of HCV is identified that is li likely to be dialysis related. You know, uh, and it has been shown that uh, the most likely cause of transmission of HCV infection from, uh, uh, from, from one infected patient to another is through contamination of surfaces. And so therefore environment cleaning is really very, very important. Uh, and once again, uh, the recommendation stresses that strategies to prevent HCV transmission should prioritize adherence to standard infection control practices and should not primarily rely upon treatment of HCV infected patients. So it is, uh, it is quite easy for us to become lazy here and say that we don't need to really adhere to infection control practices because we'll, we'll uh, just go ahead and treat all everyone who becomes HCV infected. So the guideline very strongly uh, rejects and discourages that, that practice here. So what are the common lapses in infection control practices which can lead to transmission of HCV infection in hemodialysis rooms. So the first of them is preparation of injection in a contaminated environment, including at patient treatment station. So injection should not be prepared at the patient treatment station. The second important uh, cause is reuse of a single dose medication vial for more than one patient. So all single dose medication vials should be dedicated to the patient. The third one is use of mobile card to transport supplies or medications to patients. So if you, if you put medications for more than one patient on the same mobile cart and, and take it from patient to patient, it increases the risk of transmission. The fourth one, just like I said, is that uh, most frequent cause of uh, transmission is, is surface. So inadequate cleaning or disinfection of shared environmental surfaces between patients is an important cause. Uh, the next one is failure to separate clean and contaminated areas. The next one is failure to change gloves and perform hand hygiene between tasks or patients. If uh, we do things in a hurried manner, and of course, if there is low staff to patient ratio, the risk of transmission increases. So what are the important infection control practices which are particularly relevant in improving hepatitis C virus transmission? The first, of course, is proper hand hygiene and glove change, especially between patient contacts before any invasive procedure and after contact with any blood or blood contaminated surface or supplies such as surface, uh, or surface of hemodialysis machines or, or any, any uh, bed which is, uh, which is uh, sort of soiled with blood or something like that. Uh, the next one is proper injectable medication preparation practices which follow aseptic technique and, they sh and, and these injectable uh, medications should be prepared prepared in an appropriate clean area and uh, they should be administered in, in a very uh, structured uh, manner. Uh, the next important infection control practice is a thorough cleaning and dis disinfection of all surfaces at the dialysis uh, station, especially high touch surfaces. And what is these high touch surfaces? They are the dialysis screen, the buttons, uh, where for example you adjust the blood flow rate, you adjust the ultrafiltration and so on. So they should be thoroughly cleaned. Uh, after each uh, dialysis session. And of course, an appro appropriate separation of clean supplies from contaminated materials and equipments. So uh, again, coming back to the two points, uh, there is often discussion about isolation and dedicated dialysis machines of, hep of hepatitis C virus. And although it is said that isolation or dedication of dialysis machines should be used as a, as a last resort, for, uh, for control of transmission of hepatitis C virus in a hemodialysis unit. Um, one of the important reasons it, is that it creates a logistic nightmare because then you will need four different areas. Uh, one area will be for hepatitis B virus positive patients, 
second will be for hepatitis C virus positive patients, the third will be for both HBV and HCV positive patients, and the fourth will be for patients who are of course both B and C negative. Now here is a table which has been adapted from CDC Health Alert which suggests the steps which, will, uh, which should be initiated and undertaken following infection of any new HCV infection. So all the infection, if there is, uh, they are reportable, they should be reported to appropriate public health authority. And you should determine HCV infection status of all patients at that time in the hemodialysis unit. Uh, you should test all patients for HCV infection unless they are already known to have an active infection uh, using a nucleic acid test. And of course, a thorough root cause analysis should be conducted for infection and all infection control lapses should be addressed. And the, uh, and the way uh, it should be done is shown here by rigorous assessment of staff infection control practices uh, which will allow you to identify lapses and once the lapses are identified and, and the various lapses which, which are shown here, hygiene, glove control practice, medicine preparation and so on, these findings should be shared with all staff members and action should be taken to address lapses. Staff education and training may be necessary and suppose you can't do it, you should perhaps hire an external con uh, consultant or, or a colleague who has, uh, who has expertise in infection prevention to make uh, recommendations in this area. And this uh, information should be communicated openly to patients uh, and they should be informed about the reason for additional HCV testing and they should be uh, given the results of their HCV tests. And if transmission within the center is suspected or confirmed, uh, you should inform all patients of, of this particular information. Now, moving on to treatment of hepatitis C virus infection, I'm sure you are interested uh, particularly in this particular uh, section. So again, you can see a number of strong recommendations which start by saying that all uh, CKD patients who are infected with hepatitis C should be evaluated for antiviral therapy and antiviral therapy should consist of an interferon-free regimen. In today's world, there is no place for interferon. And the choice for specific regimen should be based on HCV genotype and subtype, viral load, uh, study of drug-drug interactions, uh, the level of uh, uh, CKD or stage of CKD, what is the stage of hepatic fibrosis, uh, is if the patient is also a candidate for liver transplant and, and by the presence of other comorbidities. And of course all kidney transplant candidates should be uh, treated in collaboration with the, with the transplant centers. This is relevant for dialysis centers which, which do only dialysis and do not do any kidney transplantation. So, uh, in, in terms of the specific recommendations for treatment, all patients with, uh, with EGFR of greater than 30 should be treated with any uh, of the available directly acting antiretroviral based regimens and this is a strong evidence. Uh, patients who have EGFR of less than 30 uh, should be preferably treated with ribavirin free uh, directly anti acting antiretroviral agents as follows. So for uh, genotype 1A, the recommendation is to use uh, Grazo, uh, Prever, uh, Elbasvir uh, combination uh, regimen. Uh, for 1B, it is uh, uh, Grazo, Prever, Elbasvir or the PROD regimen, uh, which is a combination of four agents, Ritonavir, a boosted uh, Paritaprenavir, uh, Optim, uh, Ombitasvir and uh, uh, Dasabuvir for 12 weeks. For genotype 4, again, uh, Grazoprevir, Elpasvir, or the 2D regimen, uh, which is again Ritonavir boosted, uh, Prati, uh, Pari Tap uh, Prever, uh, Ombitasvir uh, for 12 weeks. And for genotypes 2, 3, 5, and 6, uh, the decision should be made on a case by case basis. And these are all the recommendations shown in a, uh, in a tabular form. Again, GFR greater than 30. Uh, 30 all available therapeutic options as per uh, the general population recommendation. Uh, GFR less than 30 uh, shown here again the same parameters or the same regimens that we discussed in the last slide. Uh, kidney transplant re recipients again uh, you can see here. Uh, so uh, for uh, for kidney transplant recipients on genotype 1 or 4 there is very little data on the use of, of the two regimens which are shown here. And similarly, uh, those uh, with GFR less than 30, 
there is no data because you know uh, it is only anecdotally that these patients are being treated and this is all off level views so if you have treated any of these patients i, I would encourage that all of you should write up these uh, uh, these cases so that uh, data will will accumulate uh, drug drug interactions are important and so here are uh, this is the table which shows drug drug interaction between the various uh, directly acting ento, uh, antiviral agents and immunosuppressive agents you can see the various immunosuppressive agents shown on the on the left uh, side the first column and uh, uh, the anti uh, antiviral agents are shown in the top row uh, and you can see that uh, the green ones that there is no clinically significant interaction the one with uh, with yellow shows some potential interaction which may require a dosage adjustment uh, or altering of the timing of administration or, or additional monitoring and the red ones uh, which which is shown here here and here means that these combinations should not be administered now moving on from uh, management of hepatitis c in in, uh, in ckd what about uh, uh, those uh, uh, who are kidney transplant candidates so uh, all kidney transplant candidates should uh, uh, it should be it should be, uh, or let me rephrase this, uh, the recommendation goes on to say that for patients, whether or not they have hepatitis C virus infection, uh, kidney transplant is the best therapeutic option for ESRD patients. All HCV infected kidney transplant patients should be evaluated for severity of liver disease and if indicated, uh, portal hypertension. And as I told you, uh, evaluation for portal hypertension should be based on uh, the fibroscan uh, report and platelet count. If the platelet count is greater than 150,000 and the elastography is less than 20 kilopascals, then you don't uh, you don't need to do more investigations of portal hypertension. Uh, all HCV infected patients with compensated cirrhosis, which means patients even if they have compensated cirrhosis, should undergo isolated kidney transplantation. Or patients who have decompensated cirrhosis should be considered for combined liver kidney transplantation and in this situation treatment of hepatitis C virus infection should be deferred until after transplantation. So what about management of hepatitis C virus in kidney transplant recipients? Uh, so timing of kidney transplant recipient in relation to kidney transplant uh, either before or after should be based on donor type, uh, living or deceased donor. In living donor we should treat them beforehand and if there is deceased donor we should treat them afterwards of course. Uh, wait list type uh, by donor type, uh, center specific policy for using or not using kidney for, from HCV infected deceased donors. So there are some centers which do use uh, kidneys from HCV infected deceased donors in which case you can go ahead and transplant kidney, uh, these kidneys and then treat patients with uh, uh, directly acting antiviral agents. So for all HCV infected patients who are candidates for kidney transplantation, uh, the guideline goes on to recommend that they should be considered for antiviral therapy either before or after transplantation. For HCV infected kidney transplant candidates with a living kidney donor, uh, the guideline suggests, so this is a lower strength of evidence, that they can be considered for treatment either before or after transplantation according to HCV genotype and anticipated timing of transplantation. So if the ante anticipated time of transplantation is quick, then you can go ahead and transplant them and treat them afterwards but if the anticipated time of a transplant is likely to be delayed, it is a good idea to treat them beforehand. If, uh, and, and the last recommendation is that if receiving a kidney from an HCV positive donor improves the chances for transplantation, HCV RNA positive, all HCV RNA positive patients can undergo transplantation with an HCV positive kidney and these patients should be treated for HCV infection after transplantation. So this is something which is important that uh, patients with HCV positive uh, status can receive an HCV positive donor kidney. So what is uh, some more uh, uh, guidelines on, on treatment of HCV infection in kidney transplant recipients? So all kidney transplant recipients who have HCV should be evaluated for treatment and they should receive a directly acting antiviral agent and the choice of regimen should be based on HCV genotype and subtype and again once again the same uh, parameters, EGFR category, liver fibrosis and so on. And again, uh, treatment with interferon should be avoided in kidney transplant recipients, which goes without saying because it can precipitate rejection. 
uh, you should uh, make a pre-treatment assessment of drug-drug interaction and we have seen the uh, slide which de uh, describes the drug-drug interaction and it is important that CNI levels should be monitored during and after antiviral uh, therapy which is a strong level of evidence and here is an uh, algorithm which has been suggested so if you have an HCV candidates uh, who are uh, who, who are candidates for kidney transplantation, the first thing to do is to test for liver fibrosis and if indicated, uh, test them for portal hypertension. Uh, so F0, starting from F0 to those with compensated cirrhosis without portal hypertension, uh, they can go ahead with transplantation uh, from isolated kidney transplantation, but if the cirrhosis is decompensated, then of course simultaneous liver kidney transplantation should be offered before any, any antiviral, antiviral therapy. So if the transplant, in the, in the first instance, if the transplantation is to be done using a living donor, the short time to transplantation, uh, uh, less than uh, 24 weeks, then treatment should be given after transplantation. But if, if the expected time for transplantation is greater than 24 weeks, G1 or 4 treat before transplantation, non-G1 or G4 can be treated either before or after transplantation. In the case of a deceased donor, if there is a possibility of HCV positive kidney uh, can be obtained rapidly, then no treatment is required prior to transplantation. Take an HCV positive or negative donor and go ahead and, and transplant and then treat after transplantation. If there is no possibility of receiving an HCV positive kidney rapidly because the transplantation center doesn't have such a policy, G1 to G4 treat before transplantation, non-G1 or G4 treat before or after transplantation. Now let's come to the specific issue of use of kidneys from HCV infected donors. The guideline will say that we recommend all kidney donors be screened for HCV infection uh, with both immunoassay and, and nucleic acid testing. Then we recommend that transplantation of kidneys from HCV RNA positive donors be direct to, re to recipients with positive nucleic acid tests, so uh, positive to positive. Uh, after assessment of liver uh, fibrosis, potential HCV positive living kidney donors who, uh, who do not have any cirrhosis should undergo uh, HCV treatment before donation and then they can be accepted for donation if they receive uh, achieve SVR and remain otherwise eligible to be a donor. So if a donor is HCV positive today, he or she is no longer automatically excluded provided he or she doesn't have cirrhosis, they should be treated and once they uh, achieve SVR, they can become uh, uh, eligible as a donor. Now, how about immunosuppression in HCV positive kidney transplant recipients? So the guideline says that all conventional current induction and maintenance immunosuppressive regimens can be considered for use in HCV infected kidney transplant recipients. We do know that many centers uh, prefer use of uh, cyclosporin rather than uh, stacrolimus in, in such situations, but there is no evidence to suggest that uh, tacrolimus is uh, any worse than cyclosporin uh, than uh, in, in these situations. So uh, how about managing HCV related complications in kidney transplant recipients? So uh, all patients who have been previously infected with HCV who, who achieved SVR before transplantation should be tested by uh, NAD three months after transplantation or if there is any liver dysfunction. All any untreated HCV positive kidney transplant uh, recipients uh, have the same liver disease follow-up as HCV positive non-transplant patients as per American uh, Association uh, for Study of Liver Disease Guidelines. HCV infected kidney transplant recipients should be tested once every six months for proteinuria to, uh, because there is data to suggest that uh, HCV positive kidney transplant recipients are at increased risk of development of proteinuria. Uh, and the next one is that we suggest patients who develop new onset proteinuria uh, should have an allograft biopsy uh, which should always include an uh, immunofluorescence and uh, electron microscopy. Uh, final recommendation is use of directly acting antiviral agent uh, in uh, patients with post-transplant HCV associated glomerulonephritis. So what should be the other testing of patients with HCV infection? So all patients in addition to HCV testing should be assessed for kidney disease uh, in, uh, in you know, any, anyone who is uh, found to have HCV infection should uh, undergo a serum creatinine and a urine examination, uh, which is the second recommendation. If there is no uh, evidence of kidney disease as an initial evaluation, patients who remain NAD positive should undergo repeat uh, screening for kidney disease 
Uh, the frequency of this is, is not really uh, optimally uh, known, uh, but uh, annual uh, follow-up uh, is reasonable at, at this particular point of time. And, and patients who have chronic kidney disease and, in the hist and have a history of HCV infection, whether or not it was nucleic acid testing positive, should be followed up regularly for progression of kidney disease. All CKD patients who have a history of HCV infection uh, should be screened and, if appropriate, pre vaccinated for both hepatitis A and hepatitis B virus, and they should also be screened for uh, HIV infection. So now let's come to HCV-associated kidney disease. So the first recommendation is that a kidney biopsy should be performed in all HCV-infected patients with clinical evidence of glomerular disease. And it should not automatically be assumed that all uh, glomerular disease is necessarily HCV related. And uh, but if there is an HCV associated glomerular disease, please note this is associated, not related. All of them should be treated for uh, HCV infection. Now, patients with HCV related glomerular disease who show stable kidney function or non nephrotic range proteinuria should be treated initially with directly acting antiviral agents. Patients who, who present with cryoglobulinemia, nephrotic syndrome, or progressive uh, kidney failure who are HCV positive should be treated with both directly act acting antiviral agents and immunosuppressive agents or plasma exchange. So this is, this is something which is important because cryoglobulinemia should receive special attention. Uh, and, and the next recommendation is the use of anti, uh, sorry, immunosuppressive therapy in patients with histologically active HCV-associated glomerular disease who do not respond to antiviral therapy. Is, uh, this is especially important for those with proglobulin anemic kidney disease. And there are a number of case reports now, for example, in patients who have HCV infection and biopsy shows membranous nephropathy, that treatment of HCV infection and, and achievement of uh, SVR is not necessarily associated with clearance of membranous nephropathy. Uh, and so therefore, you should test for additional things like anti 2 and so on and so forth. And if immunosuppressive agent is indicated in anyone uh, who has uh, cryoglobulinemia, nephrotic syndrome in association with HCV infection, the first line treatment in this situation is And this is going to be the table uh, which, which basically recapitulates the same points. Uh, so that we should first manage them with interferon-free regimens. Acute flares of cryoglobulinemia should be treated with plasma exchange retux and antiviral therapies. Additional immunosuppressive drugs, of course, include steroids, cyclophosphamide, and MMF. Uh, relapses of symptomatic mixed cryoglobulinemia should be managed with an additional dose of rituximab or other immunosuppressants if needed. SCV-related glomerular disease who are non-responders or intolerant to antiviral therapy should be treated with rituximab. Uh, low dose rebavirin should be given for treatment of HCV induced glomerular disease and claritin clearance less than 50 with close monitoring of uh, hemoglobin concentration and uh, sustained uh, viral response uh, changes in kidney function, evolution of proteinuria, and side effect of antiviral therapy must be carefully monitored. Of course, ACE inhibitors and ART should be given to all patients uh, to maximally reduce urinary protein losses and diuretics and antihepatins should be used uh, to. Uh, achieve at, uh, recommended blood pressure targets in patients with chronic kidney disease. So this is, in summary, the guidelines uh, uh, in HCV infection. And uh, here is uh, my email address. And uh, uh, I'm happy to take a question. If, if you guys are on Twitter, then uh, please follow me on Twitter. Uh, the Twitter handle is given there. And, and you can do that. So happy to take any questions. But I think as you're thinking of your questions, uh, a few more points. So uh, you should know that even though there is the, the data is, is weak, uh, sofosfovir may be the only th therapeutic option for a genotype 2, 3, 5, and 6. Uh, you know, uh, and if ribavirin use is not possible because of anemia, use ga gazaprovir and elbasvir for 16 weeks in genotype 1 cases. Uh, that is what the recommendation is. In, uh, also, in genotype 1A with high viral load, which is defined by more than 800,000 copies, uh, you should prolong the treatment again to 16 weeks and use ribavirin if possible in this situation, because uh, this combination has been shown to increase the uh, SVR to 99%. Uh, if you if you uh, treat only for 12 weeks, the SVR rate is uh, is 88%.
Now, if you want to use uh, software, uh, uh, use of uh, reduced doses such as 200 milligrams daily or 400 milligrams twice a day has been shown to actually cause reduced SVR. So uh, you should try to use full dose uh, uh, sofa as far as possible. There is always a question whether uh, sofa can accelerate or renal, uh, renal failure progression or not. And there is something which uh, uh, which is not clear. So you know you need to be careful monitoring kidney function in everyone who uh, who receives this therapy. So now, as you are thinking of a question, let me uh, go ahead and 